urban sprawl. It's found all over the world. And inside this sprawl is public transit, from buses to light rail, all the way up to heavy commuter rail. Needless to say, public transit is a very important part of society all around the world. From Germany's U-Bahn, to Switzerland's Gotthard Railway. Yes, it would seem that public transit all around the world is uh, an important part of infrastructure and for the most part very well refined and very well done. Well, with one exception really. The question on a lot of Americans' minds recently is why is America's public transportation so bad? And to answer that, we have to go back. Way back. In the late 1800s, horse-drawn carriages and horses were the typical mode of transportation. Other than that, you usually had to walk or use a bicycle. There was, however, an alternative. You see, in 1832, in New Orleans, the first horse car was created, followed closely behind by New York. These horse cars were essentially just a horse-drawn carriage on rails, and they were the first real popular form of public transportation. And starting in 1888, the horse was replaced by electricity, creating the first trolley or tram, also known as a streetcar. However, in the late 1800s, all of this would start to see a rival. You see, the automotive industry saw a massive boom, led by this man here, Henry Ford, and the creation and popularization of the Model T, his creation, which has led to this. It goes without saying that cars were a luxury and only affordable by the most wealthy, whereas everyone else had horses and buggies. My, how the times have changed, am I right? Of course, that all changed in 1920 when the Great Depression hit and nobody could afford basically anything. It lasted until a certain German dictator decided he wanted to be a horrible human being. To have had such a lad, tell your sweetheart not to mind, to be proud her boys in line over there. With World War II having kicked off in 1939 and America joining the fight in 1941, Automotive manufacturers often found themselves switching from cars to aircraft and tanks. On the perimeters of 20-odd fields of the Air Force, more than 400 forks and liberators, with their 4,000 crew members, taxi for the takeoff. At the end of World War II, all these manufacturing companies were left with all this equipment and nothing to do with it. And that's when they decided, hey, let's start making cars. What really helped it along, though, was an act from 1933 that my second cousin, twice removed, decided would be a good idea and ended up basically dooming public transportation. From then on, cars started becoming easier to get, highways started expanding, and public transportation was a long-lost memory until about the 1970s, when public transit started to look like a better idea, all because of one thing, the 1973 oil embargo. No, no, this is not a video about the Yom Kippur War. This is a video about public transportation. Let's get back on track. Speaking of tracks. Light rail started to see a resurgence around the same time that public transit did after having a lot of their infrastructure torn apart by the National City Alliance Company at the behest of General Motors. Yes, that General Motors, in 1939. But unfortunately, not everything started recovering very well. While both buses and light rail were starting to see some success, heavy commuter rail was seeing the exact opposite. 
Passenger service route miles fell from 107,000 miles in 1958 to just 49,000 miles in 1970, which was also the last year of full private operation. Proliferation of aircraft becoming the new way to get to different cities from the your current city led to 20 different companies merging together to form Amtrak, which at the time of recording is the only interstate heavy commuter rail in the United States of America. For now, at least. Okay, let's go. Jumping all the way from the 1970s and 80s all the way to 2009, the 111th Congress of the United States enacted the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, in which public infrastructure was given about $831 billion in which they used to improve themselves. Led by Barack Obama and the 111th Congress of the United States. This led public transit to have that slow increase skyrocket with the increase of funding. Depending on the state, really. In some states, it has improved dramatically, and in other states, it's kind of remained stagnant or more of the same. Last jump cut to today, where public transit is starting to see yet another uptick after having to deal with the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic and the downturn in public transit due to the virus. Nowadays, public transit, it really does depend on which state you're in. However, as a general rule of thumb, usually on the East Coast, you have better public transportation than you do on the West Coast. And for good reason, too considering how densely packed each of the cities on the East Coast is and how long those cities have been standing, it makes sense why their public transportation is a lot more refined than it is on the West Coast. That being said, the West Coast still does try to have some public transportation. However, in the literal desert that is the West Coast, there is one state that has something that sets itself apart from the rest. Something so good that it gives the East Coast a run for its money. And it all started with hand cards. But that's for another video. Public transit in the United States has a long and storied history, but we have to make sure that it continues to improve. Public transit is an important part of infrastructure, and it helps people all around the United States of America. As for me, well, I'm glad to have taken this journey with you all. I hope you all learned something, and I hope you enjoyed the journey as well. I thank you for watching, and stay tuned to the channel, where we will continue our journey way back. Thanks for watching.